Well, the opportunity was for us sticking with our original mantra, which is basically workforce housing. So our consolidation has, it's a 15 year humble story. We started with 24 units, we're now at 10,000. Um, across the, the three prairie provinces, specifically Alberta and Saskatchewan. We have one asset in Manitoba and downtown Winnipeg, but for the most part, it's low density housing. So it's that, it's that product that you would drive by on the way to work that you don't ever pay any attention to. Typically speaking, the 18 to 30 suite buildings, we own north of 460 of those buildings. And really what it allowed us to do through the pandemic is base, we have a very significant back office or what we call our platform centralized out of Calgary. And what we've been able to do is really focus on managing, you know, using best practices to manage the multifamily. It allowed us, I would say, a competitive advantage if I can use that um, because we're at scale to operate maybe a little bit differently than some of the smaller operators. As a result, if, you know, if we, when, when we saw some of these smaller operators look for a, a strategic exit, we were there and we could fold their inventory into our, that acquisition into our overall portfolio and platform. It's worked out rather, rather well for us. Yeah, when I think about these smaller operators and multifamily, I start thinking about condos and at least what we're seeing in the city of Toronto is that rents have pulled back rather dramatically during the pandemic. And you do wonder if the mom and pop condo investor can sort of hold on through the pandemic. It sounds like what you're saying to me is that some of them have decided that at this point, we can't carry on and there's the opportunity for you. Sure, great. I think what it comes down to for us is it's more the mop, mom and pop building owner. So again, the smaller, so not necessarily condos, because we don't own any condos in the portfolio. It's all, you know, single, single buildings. So that low rise, low density. And I think what it comes down to is it's very difficult to, you know, to, when you think of restrictions, lockdowns, you know, the, the necessary requirements to keep buildings clean, to keep, you know, tenants and staff or residents for that matter, um, socially distant. The challenge will always be to be able to do that efficiently and at scale. And when you have to adapt, when you think of risk of collections, when you think of if all of those, those different dynamics that have now been paramount in obviously this, the million pivots that we've done over the course of the last nine, 10 months, you recognize that that's a challenge for some of these small operators. And they are saying, well, it's been a great run, especially in the prairies. When you think of some of them, if we could been, let's say, constricted with some tighter lending, some tighter lending rules, obviously credit hurdles, things like that. So we become that viable option to sell into. What does it look like in terms, you mentioned the collection, right? I mean, obviously this is the revenue stream from owning these kinds of properties. We were worried in the early days of the pandemic when the, the unemployment rate shot up, the jobless numbers were in the millions. Uh, but of course the government put a lot of money out the door and we haven't seen in other asset classes, uh, people not being able to make their payments, whether it's mortgages. So in your business, are you still seeing that, that stream of income come through? Is there enough support out there for these families? It's actually, you know, our collection rates have actually increased since the pandemic. And I think, you know, by, by no fluke, what we've managed to do is, is focus on a particular subset of the multifamily market, which we, which we call workforce housing. So if we think of our asset base, it's typically B and C class assets, low density as mentioned. And when we think of that resident or that customer of ours, that has turned out to be the backbone of the Canadian economy. Those are the folks that are frontline workers, folks doing logistics, deliveries, uh, folks that are, you know, the lifeblood or backbone keeping the Canadian economy going while others are potentially at home, are working remotely, unable to, unable to go into their, into the office, et cetera. So you see that maybe a behavioral shift has occurred on our end. That's how, that's how we're looking at it. And what I mean by that, typically speaking, is the focus on housing and shelter has been paramount. So, you know, we found that rent collection is arguably two, it's 2% 2 higher for us than it was. Typically we run about 95, 96% of rent collected on that given month. We're now, we're now peaking over 97%. So we're very happy with it. And really it's showing that this this particular asset class and the subset of the asset class has worked out very well for us in terms of, you know, the uh, 
the counter cyclical nature, or we'll call it pandemic proof in some respects. Yeah, it's been a lot of interesting outcomes this year when we think about what we might have thought uh, the economy and society would have looked like when the pandemic that a lot of people were you know, fearing for a long time would come finally came and I, a lot of surprises. But for 2021, uh, where do you think the opportunities are and where do you, how do you think real estate unfolds throughout the year where hopefully more and more of us are getting vaccinated? Well, I mean, I, I would say, you know, we've what we're seeing is, as mentioned, we have you know, north of 460 buildings within our portfolio. I think we've anticipated and we forecast maintaining what we've been doing to date, which is, you know, social distancing protocols, um, cleaning protocols, you know, maintaining them, growing them. We don't necessarily see things changing arguably till Q3, Q4. Um, there'll be a certain percentage of folks that will be vaccinated. We're not looking at from a, from a forward business perspective, that our tenant base, our resident base for that matter, will actually be vaccinated and everything will return back to normal. We're assuming that things will be as they are today. If we see green shoots in terms of progression in, you know, caseloads coming down, et cetera, we'll be happy to see that. But we're pretty comfortable the way we are hunkered in and based on our operating protocols are working for us. When you look at your portfolio, do you see differences in geographies? I just think in terms of the fact that we know that Alberta is facing, along with the rest of us, COVID-19, all the implications of that, but also getting hit very hard by the downturn in oil. In the meantime, you get big urban centers like Toronto and others where a lot of the white collar workers, you simply went home with a laptop and a few cell phones. There seems to be some geographic disparities in terms of how hard people are getting hit during this pandemic. You know, for, for us, we're not, you know, we're in 17 geographies across the prairies. Uh, we're not necessarily seeing that. As mentioned, we really focus on that workforce housing component. So, the, and typically speaking in all of our geographies, we're not sector specific. So again, if you think of our, our asset base and where we've positioned ourselves, we're very much the hub of a hub and spoke model. So typically speaking, we're in trading areas or in the major centers. Correspondingly, what we're seeing is actually a flight to affordability. So our aggregate occupancy continues to rise month over month, quarter over quarter through the pandemic. So we see that we see that consistent theme throughout 2021. We're, we're happy with it because when we look at and, you know, using your, your words in terms of the, the regional disparities economically, but what we're seeing is from a from an affordability construct. Alberta and Saskatchewan have some of the is are some of the cheapest places to live in the country, especially when you think of median income. So it's it's worked well for us. We're not we're not shiny and new big brand new builds. We're that existing low rise, and as a result, um, we we certainly don't see the the variances or the wobbles that maybe others would in our market. We're very consistent and in fact growing and accreting. So it's 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 been. It's been a good time for us to test our business model and it seems to be working quite well. Before I let you go, I did want to ask you about cost of capital because when I think about uh, the real estate space and what we've seen and, and uh, other asset classes, not the type that you play in, but obviously money was made cheap because of the strains of the pandemic and the central bankers go to pains every time they open their mouths to assure us that they're going to stay on this cheap money path for several years. How, do, how does that play into your strategy? Well, it plays well. I mean, it's a real estate, you know, when we think of real estate, we think of obviously yielding assets, income yielding assets. So when we see monetary policy, um, which is based on, you know, low to no interest rates, um, cost of capital allows, you know, if, again, depending on the organization for us, because we have the ability to operate at scale, um, access to capital through both the financial institutions, you know, term debt, et cetera, it's available. Um, I would say the institutions are becoming more choosy in terms of who they're allocating that term debt to. However, it's there and available, so it's very exciting for us. On top of that, when we see, again, when we look at real estate, we look at sector rotation, even within real estate, we, you know, there's, there's definitely a propensity for whether it be passive institutional investors to invest in multifamily. And from our perspective, the, the cost of capital, because there is, there is, I think there's a constant desire to see invest, you know, to acquire real estate or to have real estate available in one's, in one's portfolio. 
cost of capital continues to, to lower for us. Um, and I would say as a result of the subclass of asset that we're buying being workforce housing, um, it, it affirms the, the tenacity and the predictability of you know, the, the, workforce, the workforce housing asset within the multifamily class.